Hi friends! Today for Fiction Friday, we're starting Chapter 2 in our ongoing book, Vlad, a Dog, by Albert Payson Terhune. Remember, each chapter is a new story in Lad's life, so you don't need to read the previous chapter to follow along. As always, the link to the ebook is in the description below if you want to read along. Chapter 2, Quiet. To Lad, the real world was bounded by the place. Outside, there were a certain number of miles of land, and there were an uncertain number of people. But the miles were uninspiring except for a cross-country tramp with the master. And the people were foolish and strange folk who either stared at him, which always annoyed Lad, or else tried to pat him, which he hated. But the place was the place. Always he had lived on the place. He felt he owned it. It was assuredly his to enjoy, to guard, to patrol from high road to lake. It was his world. The denizens of every world must have at least one deity to worship. Lad had one, the master. Indeed, he had two, the master and the mistress. And because the dog was strong of soul and chivalric withal, and because the mistress was altogether lovable, Lad placed her altar even above the master's, which was holy as it should have been. There were other people at the place, people to whom a dog must be courteous, as becomes a thoroughbred, and whose caresses he must accept. Very often there were guests too, and from puppyhood Lad had been taught the sacredness of the guest law. Civilly, he would endure the pettings of these visiting outlanders. Gravely, he would shake hands with them on request. He would even permit them to paw him or haul him about if they were of the obnoxious dog-mauling breed. But the moment politeness would permit, he always withdrew very quietly from their reach and, if possible, from their sight as well. Of all the dogs on the place, Big Lad alone had free run of the house by day and by night. He slept in a cave under the piano. He even had access to the sacred dining room at mealtimes, where he always laid to the left of the master's chair. With the master, he would willingly unbend for a romp at any or all times. At the mistress's behest, he would play with all the silly abandon of a puppy, rolling around on the ground at her feet, making as though to seize and crush one of her little shoes in his mighty jaws, wriggling and waving his legs in air when she buried her hand in the masses of his chest ruff, and otherwise comporting himself with complete loss of dignity. But to all except those two, he was calmly unapproachable. From his earliest days, he had never forgotten he was an aristocrat among inferiors, and calmly aloof, he moved among his subjects. Then, all at once, into the sweet routine of the House of Peace came horror. It began on a blustery, sour October day. The mistress had crossed the lake to the village in her canoe, with Lad curled up in a furry heap on the prow. On the return trip, about 50 yards from shore, the canoe struck sharply and obliquely against a half-submerged log that a fall freshet had swept across the river, above the lake. At the same moment, a flaw of wind caught the canoe's corner. And after a manner of such eccentric craft, the canvas shell proceeded to turn turtle. Into the chill waters splashed its two occupants. Lad bobbed to the top and glanced around to see at the mistress to learn if this were a new practical joke. But instantly he saw it was no joke at all, so far as she was concerned. Swathed and cramped by the folds of her heavy outing skirt, the mistress was making no progress shoreward, and the dog flung himself through the water toward her with a rush that left his shoulders and half his back above the surface. In a second he had reached her and caught her sweater shoulder in his teeth. She had the presence of mind to lie out straight, as though she were floating, and to fill her lungs with a swift intake of breath. The dog's burden was thus made infinitely lighter than if she had struggled or had lain in a posture easy for towing. Yes, he made scant headway until she wound one hand in his mane, and still lying motionless and stiff, bade him loose his hold on her shoulder. 
In this way, by sustained effort that wretched every giant muscle in the collie's body, they came at last to land. Vastly rejoiced was Lad, and inordinately proud of himself, and the plaudits of the master and mistress were music to him. Indefinably, he understood he had done a very wonderful thing, and that everyone on the place was talking about him, and that they all were trying to pet him at once. This promiscuous handling he began to find unwelcome, and he retired at last to his cave under the piano to escape from it. Matters soon quieted down, and the incident seemed at an end. Instead, it had just begun. For within an hour, the mistress, who for days had been half sick with a cold, was stricken with a chill, and by night she was in the first stages of pneumonia. Then over the place descended gloom, a gloom Lad could not understand until he went upstairs at dinner time to escort the mistress, as usual, to the dining room. But to his light scratch at her door there was no reply. He scratched again, and presently the master came out of the room and ordered him downstairs again. Then from the master's voice and look, Lad understood that something was terribly amiss. Also, as she did not appear at dinner, and as he was for the first time in his life forbidden to go into her room, he knew the mistress was the victim of whatever mishap had befallen. A strange man with a black bag came to the house early in the evening, and he and the master were closeted for an interminable amount of time in the mistress's room. Lad had crept dejectedly upstairs behind them and sought to crowd into the room at their heels. The master ordered him back and shut the door in his face. Lad lay down on the threshold, his nose to the crack at the bottom of the door, and waited. He heard the murmur of speech. Once he caught the mistress's voice, changed and muffled, and with a puzzling new note in it, but undeniably the mistress's, and his tail thumped hopefully on the hall floor, but no one came to let him in. And after the mandate to keep out, he dared not scratch for admittance. The doctor almost stumbled across the couchant body of the dog as he left the room with the master. Being a dog owner himself, the doctor understood, and his narrow escape from a fall over the living obstacle did not irritate him, but it reminded him of something. Those other dogs of yours outside there, he said to the master, as they went down the stairs, raised a fearful racket when my car came down the drive just now. Better send them all away somewhere till she is better. The house must be kept perfectly quiet. The master looked back up the stairway at its top, pressed close against the mistress's door, crouched lad. Something in the dog's heartbroken attitude touched him. I'll send them over to the boarding kennels in the morning, he answered. All except lad. He and I are going to see this through together. He'll be quiet if I tell him to. Well, that's all the time we have to read today. Of course Lad will be quiet if the master says to be. Lad is a good, obedient dog, just looking to do what's right for his master and mistress. I'm still learning all of that, but I love how Lad still acts like a puppy with his master and mistress. I act like a puppy with my mommy and daddy, but then I am still a puppy. Be sure to join us next week for part two, and on Monday for our next Music Monday song. Thanks for hanging out with me today.